In your testimony, you refer to private military companies that Russia relies on to undermine other nations' sovereignty. To the extent possible in this open setting, can you share your perspective on the relationship between the Wagner Group and the Ru Russian forces at the operational level? And are you seeing the Wagner Group's presence in Africa change as a result of the war in Ukraine? As you know, uh, the Wagner Group is a mercenary private military company. They're conducting combat operations right now in Bakhmut primarily. There's probably about 6,000 or so actual mercenaries and maybe another 20 or 30,000 recruits that they get, many of whom come from prisons. Um, and they are suffering an enormous amount of casualties in the Bakhmut area. The Ukrainians are inflicting uh, a lot of death and destruction on these guys. In addition to uh, Bakhmut and Ukraine, Wagner Group is in many, many other places, uh, most notably in West Africa. Uh, where they essentially have taken over a, a country. Um, and they are, uh, they pushed out the French out of, I think it was Mali, uh, and some uh, other places. So the Wagner Group's a very aggressive group. It's led by a very ruthless guy, Prigozhin. Uh, he purports to be a, uh, you know, businessman, but he's got an incredible criminal background behind him. Um, so uh, this is a dangerous group. Uh, they're quite large, they're quite powerful, and they're, they have uh, at least reached uh, throughout parts of Europe and into Africa and, and maybe some parts of the Middle East. We ran into them in the Middle East uh, a couple of years ago uh, in Syria uh, with about a battalion-sized force that was attacking one of our positions and, and we destroyed that force. Uh, so they are there, they're aggressive, they're no, most of them are former Russian soldiers of one kind or another. A lot of internationals work with them as well. So very dangerous group, long reach, very wealthy, very rich, and they are probably very uh, disruptive internal to Russian society. Chairman Milley. With respect to Bakhmut, which you mentioned earlier, it appears that Russia is still unable to accomplish core strategic objectives. It is frankly remarkable to me that Bakhmut still stands and is still owned by the Ukrainians. Do you share the perspective that the failure of Russia after going all out to capture this town is indicative of the fact that we're still facing, that the Ukrainians rather are still facing the same deeply incompetent military that they were facing last year? Or is this a, a special brand of incompetence that we're seeing with respect to this particular military effort? I think the Russians are struggling uh, in a big way with command and control, logistics, sustainment, basic tactical doctrine, but also training. Uh, these forces are very undertrained. They're essentially doing frontal assaults into machine gun positions, et cetera, and they're getting slaughtered. The Russian troops are. The Ukrainians are doing a very effective area defense uh, that has uh, proven to be very costly to the Russians. For about the last uh, 20, 21 days, the Russians have not made any progress whatsoever uh, in and around Bakhmut. So it's a slaughter fest for the Russians. Uh, they're getting hammered in the, in the vicinity of Bakhmut, and the Ukrainians have fought very, very well. That's also true across the entire frontline trace from Crimea all the way down to Kyrgyzstan. The Ukrainians have fought a remarkable defensive fight, and the Russians have uh, not achieved their strategic objectives. Do you see the Russian objectives with respect to Bakhmut as being part of their offensive, or would you say this is a special effort and the broader offensive has yet to begin? No, I think it's the latter. I think, they, they, I think the Russian offensive, if you will, began some time ago, and it has had fits and starts, and it has not achieved the momentum and success that they expected it to achieve. If I could ask you a broader question, which you may not be able to answer, if we had never supported the Ukrainians at all, would Russia have conquered Ukraine by now? I think without Western support, I, first of all, I think the, the Ukrainian people, their will is indomitable. Uh, the, these are the same people, they're the sons and grandsons of the folks who fought Stalin and Zhukov for 10 years from 1945 to 1955. So the Ukrainians are not going to be easily conquered no matter what. If they're fighting with pitchforks and, 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 and spears, they're going to fight back. Uh, but having said that, they would have uh, probably lost considerably more ground without Western assistance. Uh, there's no question in my mind about that. So I think Western assistance has been critical to the Ukrainians being able to defend themselves. With respect to Putin, it seems to me, seems to a lot of folks, very clear that he's a war criminal, lots of evidence for this, and yet there are plenty of people in this country who still don't see it that way, who see Putin as basically a national leader pursuing national interests. If you could speak to those folks and give us your sense on his status as a war criminal, that would be appreciated. I think the war itself is illegal. It, it, it undermines the very under, uh, one of the first principles that were established after World War II uh, that underwrites the so-called rules-based international order that is part of the United Nations, for example, which is wars of aggression, uh, which are unprovoked, not in the cause of defense, 
uh, where large countries then use their military force to attack smaller countries, not in the defense of their own nation. Uh, and, and Ukraine presented no military threat whatsoever to Russia, and yet he lined up 170, 100, or 200,000 troops, multiple divisions, multiple acts of advance, and he conducted a major league war of aggression. A war of aggression in and of itself is a war crime. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the actual war crimes in, in many of the cities and towns. Uh, you, when you bomb and shell civilian cities, when you bomb and shell uh, civilian infrastructure, uh, when, you're, when you're killing uh, kids and women and children, uh, all of that, uh, all of that is uh, war criminal, uh, war crimes. And, and their units, their unit commanders, all the way up the chain are committing war crimes. Uh, the Russian forces are. Uh, and it's a tragic unfolding of events, but it's true. Uh, there's a lot of war crimes being committed by the Russian forces in Ukraine. Putin has you know, clearly mis made some of the most uh, outrageous miscalculations uh, of any leader in, in modern times. Uh, he miscalculated the will and, and commitment of the Ukraine people. He made a major miscalculation uh, in mis and not understanding the leadership of the U.S. and the commitment of the U.S. to lead. And he made another miscalculation in, in not understanding how our allies, our transatlantic allies in particular, but even our global allies, even beyond NATO, how they're banded together uh, so coherently and strongly under this leadership. Uh, and I've, I've been able to witness this, not only as a member of this committee, uh, both informed by classified and public information, but also uh, with my service on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, where I've chaired and ranked uh, on uh, the European subcommittee for that time, and engaged in uh, very private and important conversations with leaders there. Uh, yet there are voices in the American public right now that will say that our coalition partners are not holding up their end of the bargain. Uh, I'm informed by information, uh, you know, that I've had that just to the contrary. In fact, it's quite extraordinary, and in some areas, in some countries, historic in nature. Uh, but can you take this opportunity to inform, from your perspectives, uh, the American public that they're wrong? Because we have people voicing those concerns and using that as a justification to say the U.S. shouldn't be committed to Ukraine because these other countries aren't holding up their end of the bargain when I've been informed that they clearly are. But can you take this moment here in front of this committee to just inform the American public that level of commitment that exists there, and how strong it is, how important it is, and, and how they are carrying great weight? Well, thank you, sir. I, I think you're exactly right. As you know, I meet with 50-plus uh, uh, nations, uh, the ministers of defense of those nations, every month. Uh, and uh, in those meetings, what I see displayed is a strong sense of commitment and unity uh, to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. As a matter of fact, that's the language that I hear them employ. Uh, some of those countries, especially the smaller ones, have given uh, a lot in, in terms of the percentage of their GDP, and they're looking for ways to do more. And when they've run out of stuff, uh, they invest money in uh, in things like uh, helping other countries expand their product lines uh, as, as we look to acquire additional munitions and, and weapons. So the commitment that I see is strong. Uh, what I've seen them provide is, uh, is, is impressive, uh, but there's always more than we can do. And you hear me uh, consistently beating the drum for more air defense and, and, and other things uh, in, in support of Ukraine. But what I've seen thus far I've seen tremendous support uh, for, uh, for Ukraine in helping it defend its sovereignty. Chairman so. Milley? Yeah, exactly the same thing. The, uh, you know, 54 countries, and obviously there's only 30 in NATO, so those come from all around the globe. Uh, you know, Britain, France, Germany, Finland, Norway, uh, Sweden, Estonia, Latvia, Poland. These countries are, Romania, these countries are pouring their heart and soul in this, and they, they realize that this threat is proximate to them. Uh, so they, you know, you look, look at Poland, how many refugees they've taken, look how, many, how many tanks they've done, and, 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 or they've provided, how many BMPs they've provided, all the training that they've done, and they are a major throughput for all the logistics, and it's not without risk. So these countries are putting in uh, as one team, and, and, and they understand the threat that's facing them.